The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. Our session today takes us to Mark chapter 5, a couple of verses in Hebrews chapter 2. And what an exciting title this is. Jesus sets us free. He does set us free, and He makes us free. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Spiritual truth. Jesus offers freedom from bondage. Bondage, something that ties you up. Can tie you up physically. Can tie you up spiritually. Jesus will set you free. He breaks the chains Those chains, the physical chains, are bad, but there are so many more chains that are in our life. And He sets us free. And He makes us free. It's our Bible focus. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. John chapter 8, verse 36. We have witnesses in this place today who can testify that they have been made free. And when He makes you free... You can not only say, I have been made free, but I am free. He has the power to keep us free. And He has the power to keep us saved. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep, the Bible tells us. So He has the power to save us. He has the power to keep us saved. He has the power to free us. He has the power to keep us free. Our first section is the first 20 verses. Freedom from bondage. And the exact heading there is freed from bondage. When someone is set free from bondage, it's such a wonderful thing. There is an exuberance. There is an excitement. When you have been bound and you've been set free, it's like being in prison, being in jail, and being allowed to go free. It's like being in a closed up place. Then you're allowed to go out and go free. And it's even so much more than that. When your life is bound, your spirit is bound, and you're so oppressed and depressed that you don't know what to do. And when Christ, in a moment, can set you free, it feels good to be right with God. And it feels good to be free. It feels good to know that you know that you know that He has set you free. Sometimes we have things in our life that go beyond us. It's more than just laying down a habit. It's more than just changing a lifestyle. Sometimes there are things in life that are spiritual beyond what we can do. And we can't do much anyway. But Jesus can break the power of the evil spirit. He can break the powers of hell. And He can set us free. This incident is recorded in several of the Gospels. Mark chapter 5, Luke chapter 8. This man that is in bondage. And verse 1 says, They came over into the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. It was important. We talked about Jesus calming the storm. He said, Peace be still to the wind. That was a great calm. That was important not just because that they could see the power of God. It's important not that they could just see Him calming the raging sea and stilling the storm. But it's important that He gets to the other side because there's someone over there that really needs His help. The disciples didn't know it. Nobody else knew it. But Jesus did. He knew there was somebody over there that needed a special touch from God. And this person had been bound for so many years by the power of the devil. And he comes, Jesus does, into the country of the Gadarenes. Gad is one of the tribes of Israel. The Gadarenes. Some people and scholars tell us that these Gadarenes had been employed in hog raising. You'll find out about this herd of swine later on. Well, the Jewish people had been mixed up so much and had gone into captivity and had come back and now they were in the land and of course we know that they have gone again and now they're coming back again. So much back and forth, up and down and mixing between the people around them. God told them not to do it. 
They did it anyway. We talk about the Gadarenes. You're not sure whether you're talking about the pure race of Jewish people or whether you're talking about mixed up people. But anyway, there are people who are Gadarenes. And he, when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. This unclean spirit is the characteristic of the type of devil or devils with which he was possessed. Unclean spirit, foul, evil. And this is responsible for so much of what's going on in our nation. It's an unclean spirit that would cause so much vulgarity and just pure nastiness on the airwaves. People are unashamed about sin and ungodliness, things that you and I would never have heard of when we were coming up. Now they just do it and they're not ashamed about it. It's an unclean spirit behind all this. Verses 2 through 4 talks about this man dwelling among the tombs, being unbindable and untamable. You notice that he was bound, but he was unbindable. In other words, man couldn't bind him, but the devil already had him bound. He was unbindable, but he was bound. And no man could tame him. He was a wild man. We talk about people being wild, and some of us perhaps were wild, but not to the point, hopefully, this man was. Not just wild because he was sowing a few wild oats. He was wild because he was controlled by the evil power of the devil. Verse 5, Always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Isn't it amazing and amazing in the bad way that when people are bound, all of us can bear witness to this. Now, we may not have been bound to the point that this man was, but when people are bound, you always do harm to yourself or those around you. Always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs. He had no rest. This evil power, this evil spirit would not let him rest. Had no joy in his life, no contentment in his life. Yet he kept searching, he kept wandering from tomb to tomb, from mountain to mountain. Wild man, nobody could tame him, nobody could bind him with chains. He would pull the chains asunder. Wild, raving maniac. He was crying and cutting himself with stones. If you think the devil's going to give you a good time and just give you pleasure and everything you want. He might give you a little pleasure. But any good time he gives you, you're going to pay for it in the end. He never gives you anything good. He always inflicts harm and danger to those with whom he has to do. And the devil sells people a bill of goods by telling them, you just come on over here. You just smoke a little bit of this. You just drink a little bit of this. and You'll have a good time. You go out here. Come on, let me show you where it's at. Yeah, he'll show you where it's at, all right. Take you straight to hell if you continue to listen to the devil. And that's what so many people are doing. They're continuing to listen to the power of the evil one. And he will take you down because that's where he goes. It's down. He tried to go up one time. It didn't work out, and he's been going down ever since. And this particular man cries, cut himself with stones. He injures himself, a danger to himself. Anytime the devil has control, you will end up hurting yourself or someone around you. Verses 6 and 7 shows him seeing Jesus afar off, worshiping him and crying out, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. When it says that he cried out, when he says that he worshipped him, some people have problems with that, but the worship is not like the worship that you and I do. We worship God from a pure, redeemed heart. He was worshipping him from a soul that was troubled. He was worshipping him 
There's something in a man, there's something in a person that cries out to God. Even though you may be out there drinking, you may be out there running around, you may be out there trying to drown all conviction that comes your way. But there's something in your heart and life that's still at unrest. There's something that's still unsatisfied. And you'll try everything. You'll go from relationship to relationship. You'll go from one drink or one drug to another. You'll go from one phase or one fad or one habit to another. You'll trade that car and buy another one. You'll get rid of that house and get another one. You keep searching for something. Well, what you're searching for is not something, but it's someone. Jesus Christ is who we need. And that's what we need. And He is the one, only He will satisfy that longing, that gap in our life. That emptiness in our life. Only He will satisfy that. And there's something in the heart of this man that worships, that cries out to Him. And the evil power that's in him knows who Jesus is. And he cries out, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I know who you are. Do not torment me. Jesus, of course, having power, all power and all authority. Verse 8, He said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Jesus has all power to expel every evil power, every unclean spirit, every sickness, every disease, everything that would come against us and put us in bondage. Jesus has the power to undo all of that. Verse that we talked about before, 1 John 3, 8, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that He might destroy the works of the devil. He comes to undo everything the devil has ever done to try to destroy humanity. Jesus comes to undo all that. Jesus demanded their name. Legion, they answered, for we are many. They went out of the man and entered into a herd of about 2,000 swine which drowned in the sea. Isn't it amazing that even swine, even old filthy swine don't want a devil in them. They'd rather drown in the sea, in the ocean than to have a devil in them. Verse 15 says that when the people went out to see it, they found the man sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. That's what Jesus can do. Here was a man that was in the tombs, in the mountains, crying and cutting himself with stones, unbindable, untamable. Nobody could do anything with him. But now when the power of the devil has been cast out of his life, He's been set free. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. No more running around. No more screaming and hollering. If you scream and holler now, it's in the Holy Spirit. It's not by the power of the devil. And he is sitting at the feet of Jesus. He's clothed and in his right mind. Got clothes on. Never have been able to do that before. Jesus saves you. Sometimes he'll have you to put some clothes on. What do you think about that? Well, that's old time of teaching and preaching, isn't it? Sometimes he might tell you not to wear a certain thing. Sometimes he might lead you not to go to a certain place. That's what Jesus will do for you. He'll set you free. Verse 18, when they, he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil, Prayed him that he might be with him. Just let me go with you, Lord. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and have had compassion on thee. I'm glad you want to be with me, but i got a better plan. I want you to go back home. I want you to tell your friends. I want you to tell your family. I want you to tell people what great things God has done for you. How he's had compassion on you. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Decapolis is known as the place of ten cities. That was the first Decapolis publishing company that man was publishing for Jesus. 
telling how great things God had done for him. That's what God wants you and I to tell. He doesn't want you to preach a sermon like the pastor. He doesn't want you necessarily to teach a lesson like the Sunday school teacher. He doesn't want you to have to build up a big case. All He wants you to do is just tell what He's done for you. Just tell what He's done in your heart and in your life. Has He done anything in your heart and your life? If He hadn't, we can help you out with that right now today. And He can do a great thing in your heart and life. But if He's done something for you, you got a message to tell. you got a testimony to share. you got a word of encouragement to give somebody because He's done something in your heart and in your life. Freed from bondage. Second section, freed from suffering. Verses 25 through 34. In the meantime, a ruler of the synagogue named Jairus begs Jesus to come and heal his daughter, who is at the point of death. Jesus goes with him and a great multitude follows. This sets the stage for a miracle that is to happen for a special person, starting in verse 25. And this makes a way where a lot of people can be with Jesus and can be a witness to this miracle that he does. A certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many positions, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. I didn't think you were supposed to suffer many things of many positions. I thought you were supposed to be made better by a physician. This says she had suffered many things of many physicians. They didn't know what to do. Well, we got sophisticated technology. We've got radar. We've got sonar. We've got all this other R stuff. But they still don't know what to do. I mean, they can do wonders. They can do great things. But they're just human people. Isn't it amazing we can spend thousands of dollars on health care and we can go to the doctor and when he says, I don't know, we take his word for it. We ask a preacher something in the Bible and he says, I don't know. We say, what's wrong with him? Wait a minute minute now. You spend thousands of dollars on the doctor when they tell you, I don't know. You say, oh, well, that's okay. We don't charge you anything. We say, I don't know. You say, what's wrong with him? He must not be, he has the Holy Ghost. He must not be right with God. No, there's a lot of things we don't know. But I know the one who does know. I know a man who can. She had suffered many things of many physicians. And it seems like to me it said right here somewhere, not only she had suffered of many physicians, but she had spent all that she had. She had spent everything she had trying to get better. Now you'll do that, won't you? If you get in a real fix, you'll spend whatever you need to spend to get better. But she was nothing better, but rather grew worse. Now, I don't want to be graphic here, but how would you ladies like to be like you are, like you used to be once a month for 12 years? Good gracious, I reckon. Give me another Pentecostal break. Woo-wee. She had a terrible time. She couldn't be around people. She was a reproach to people. She was ashamed of herself. Shouldn't have been ashamed of herself. She couldn't help it. And by the way, if you have a crippling, if you have a debilitating condition, if you have a disability, there's nothing to be ashamed of because all of us are accomplished about with infirmity. All of us have things in our life that are not exactly right. The older you get, the body doesn't do what it used to do. There are things in our life that don't work the way that we want them to work. So all of us, you have a disability, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Because all of us have physical ailments and shortcomings, and that's why we have a healer named Jesus. And yes, that's why we do go to the altar more than one time, because we need more than one time to go, because we are needy people. We need a lot And our God is a lot need-meeting God. He's a big God. He can handle everything that we have. When she had heard of Jesus, came behind in the press and touched His garment, 
For she said, If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Somehow, the same Jesus who had sought and called disciples, and people were drawn to him, people had heard of him and were hearing about him, were hearing about the wonderful things that he did, and it caused something in the heart of people, just like this demon-possessed man who could not help himself, but something in his heart cried out to God. And something in the heart of people, something in our heart causes us to cry out to God. And we worship Him. And we see our longing. And we see that our need can be fulfilled. We can be healed. We can be satisfied. We can be saved. We can be delivered just by coming to Him. If I can but touch His clothes. And of course, we read some places, I can touch the hem of His garment. I shall be whole. This is what she said. And she believed it. Straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. When Jesus touches you, you're not saved by feeling, you're not healed by feeling, but sooner or later you're going to feel better. Sooner or later the feeling's going to come. She felt in her body that she was made whole. She was afraid. She didn't know what to do. Jesus said, somebody touch me. Everybody denied. The disciples said, Lord, what's wrong with you? Everybody touched you. Somebody touched you. Who hadn't touched you? Everybody's touching you. He said, yeah, but somebody specifically touched me. Somebody touched me believing because I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And I know that somebody touched me. This woman, finally, she said, I'm the one. He said, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you whole. You don't have anything to be ashamed about. You've been ashamed for your last day. Now you can be made whole. And she was completely healed of that awful, dreaded disease. Nobody could cure it. Yeah, her faith certainly could have healed her. I'm glad you asked that question. She she asked, did she have to touch him to be healed? That the touch was just a point of contact. That was her way of releasing her faith. She said, if I can but touch his clothes, touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. That was what she was believing for. And that was what she needed to do. She didn't have to touch him. But we do have to act our faith. Whatever that means. It might mean coming to an altar for special prayer. Sometimes when people call for the altar, and they'll say, come for special prayer, and people just come. But we shouldn't just come. We should come specifically. I'm believing God to touch me now. And she acted her faith. The Scripture says, faith without works is dead. So if we say, I have faith, but that faith doesn't cause us to act. We're not healed by our actions, but we're healed by our faith that causes us to act. So faith as a noun by itself is just dead like a casket. But believing is a verb, and believing causes us to act. And the faith is the basis of our believing. The reason that we act is because it's based on faith. If it's not based on faith, it's just an action. That's just an action... It could be just a programmable thing. It doesn't mean anything. But because it's based on faith, her body felt that she was healed. And in a moment, the virtue was released from Christ when she acted her faith. And it could have been, someone said that she could have touched the place of one of his footprints. And if she had acted the same faith, the same results would have taken place. It was not the power in his garment. There was no power in the garment. There's power in Christ, of course. There's the power of the Holy Spirit. But there's no power in his clothes. There's no power on the ground. The power is in the faith, the action of the faith. When she acted her faith, she was healed. And that's when we are healed, when we act our faith. It's important to encourage people to believe. Don't put people down. They may just have a little bit of faith. Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, great things can happen. So encourage that faith. Stir up that faith. Don't let it lie dormant. 
Don't let it just be there and you don't act on it. Act your faith. There's something that happened in the heart of this woman when she heard of Jesus. She came and went through all that crowd. And it was an ordeal to get through all that crowd. And sometimes by the time that we get to Jesus, and I know Jesus is everywhere, He's in our heart, but by the time we get to that place that we act our faith, our faith is high and excited and we're something's got to happen. Just like that man who was let down through the roof when he reached his destination, something was going to happen. Because he acted his faith too. Now he was paralyzed, he couldn't reach out and touch Jesus. But he allowed those men to carry him down through that roof and that was acting his faith. Absolutely. Well, like I said, faith, just the word faith is a noun. Noun is dead, just like this right here. It can't do anything, but faith, the reason faith does something is because it's based on, believing is based on faith. And when we believe, that causes us to act. And when we act, we act our faith. Just like Abraham and Rahab, James chapter 2, they're actions showed their faith. They were justified by faith, but they were justified by their acting their faith too. Rahab received the messengers. She acted her faith. Abraham offered up Isaac. He didn't have to go all the way through with it, but he, in his heart he did it. He offered him up and he acted his faith. That's the same way this woman did. She believed. And her believing is acting her faith. It caused her to do something. She wasn't healed because she did something, but if she hadn't done anything, she could have said, I have faith, I have faith, I have faith, but if you're not going to do anything about it, you're still going to have faith. You say you have faith, but you're going to lie there and be sick because you are not acting your faith. What did Jesus tell her? Your faith has made you whole. Well, faith as a noun by itself doesn't do anything, but the reason her faith made her whole is because she acted her faith. What about the third section? Free from death. Death is that last enemy that will be destroyed. Jesus had been informed about this little girl who was dying. And now this woman had been healed with the issue of blood. On the way to heal this little girl, raise her up. This woman with the issue of blood had been healed. Jesus knew that by the time he had gotten through with this woman, this little girl would be passed away. While he yet talked to the woman and said, Your faith has made you whole, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. The thing that strikes me about that verse is as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken. So many times... We allow ourselves to be taken out of the supernatural because of the so much natural that's around us. Well, I tell you, Danny, I just don't know about it. I just don't know. Things are getting bad. Things are getting bad. People don't want to come to church anymore. People don't want to go downstairs anymore. People don't want to... And we start talking about negative things. This girl is already dead. There's no need to bother the master any further. Jesus could have went along with that. He said, yeah, I'll tell you what, I've got a lot of other stuff I need to do. But it said, as soon as he heard the word that was spoken, he told the man, don't worry about it, only believe. Sometimes we have to stick like glue, and like Elmer's glue. Sometimes we really have to hold on. Sometimes we have to not allow anything to pry us loose from thus saith the Lord. When the natural is so strong, the wind is blowing, the thunder is rumbling, the storm is raging, the fever is there, the symptoms are there. Everything points to death, and Jesus points to life. We have to hold on. Don't bother the Master any further. Everything is bad. The president's bad, the cabinet's bad, the nation's bad. Everybody seems like they want to go to hell. 
Don't worry about it. The church is getting bad. Everything's getting liberal. Everything's going bad. And then we justify it with the Bible. Said, you know, the Bible said everything would be bad in the last days. No, it didn't say everything would be bad in the last days. It said that evil would increase in the last days, but that doesn't have to be us. We don't have to be a part of that at all. God doesn't want us to be a part of that. We get to looking at things, and we get to justifying evil, and accepting defeat and death. And this immediately, Jesus counteracted that. Immediately he said, be not afraid, only believe. Verse 39, he was come in, he saith unto them, why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. They laughed him to scorn. And I have in my notes here, we better be careful who we laugh at or make fun of. They laughed Jesus to scorn. Can you imagine making fun of the master of glory, the Lord of glory, the creator? They made fun of him. They laughed him to scorn. They knew that she was dead. She was dead physically, but he was talking beyond that. She's just sleeping. Just watch what I'll do. Verse 41, he took the damsel by the hand, saith unto her, Talitha kuma, this is Greek that's left there for interpretation, which being interpreted is, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. Whether it's a demon-possessed man, whether it's a woman that's afflicted with an issue of blood, or whether it's a little girl that's passed away, Jesus is still the same. They were astonished with a great astonishment. And Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that this was what Jesus came to do to deliver mankind, deliver us all. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. How can he get and gain the victory over death? He had to die himself, that through death he might deliver them who through all their lifetime were in fear and bondage because of death. He might defeat him who had the power of death. Because we did what God told us not to do, we signed the devil's receipt. He had our receipt. The package he sent to us, we accepted it. And we were doomed. We were in bondage. We were slaves to him forever. But Jesus came and he set us free. The devil had the power of death over us. He had the receipt that we had signed for the package. But Jesus came, and He delivered us from the power of the devil. He set us free. And we are free, because not only did Jesus die, but He rose again, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Father, I thank You today for Your love. I thank You for such a wonderful Word that You've given to us. Thank You that we can believe. Thank You that we can act our faith. Thank You that we can reach out to You, and You can set us free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. And we thank you, Lord. I pray that many people will be set free today by the power of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 